Good evening. I'm delighted to welcome you to the London Assembly's annual chairs event. My name is Navin Shah, and I'm chair of the London Assembly. The London Assembly holds the Mayor of London to account and investigates the issues that matter to Londoners. This year, our focus has been on the COVID-19 pandemic, the devastating impact it has had on Londoners' lives and what we can do as Assembly members to help Londoners during this crisis. The pandemic has transformed our way of life. It has changed our behavior and our city. It has worsened existing problems for the most disadvantaged and vulnerable people. It has had a devastating and disproportionate impact on black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities. We will never forget those eight minutes and 46 seconds. And the last words of George Floyd, I can't breathe. These words are a devastating reminder of the inequality and racism ingrained in our society. Enough is enough. Black lives do matter. The fact is none of us can breathe. We are faced with an immense collective challenge to rid this country of structural racism, something we must deliver for a just and equal society. I know diversity is a force for good, and this is why I'm honored to showcase London's diverse spirit in this evening. Over the past year, we have seen how Londoners from all different backgrounds have helped their local communities as we face the greatest crisis since World War II. Whether that has been handling, handing out food parcels to the vulnerable, becoming NHS first responders, providing hot meals for exhausted healthcare staff, shopping for elderly neighbors, or volunteering in local vaccination centers. In my local area of Brent and Harrow, I have been astounded by the community spirit I have seen in action. The world famous Nisden Temple has reached out to communities across London and even uh, within Europe, from Brent to Leicester and Amsterdam, delivering over 50,000 meals to elderly and vulnerable people and supporting 210 hospitals and key workplaces. And the Harrow Central Mosque, it has set up a helping hands support service, which has provided food shopping and medicine collection service, cooked meals and emergency food parcels. Then there is the London Community Kitchen, working from the Harrow Hub, who are actively locally working throughout London. Working with Brent Indian Association, the London Community Kitchen supported over 2,000 people in a day with food parcels. These are just but a few examples of much wider pattern. Londoners have gone above and beyond their responsibility to help each other during an unprecedented time in our city's history, despite differences in faith, ethnicity, gender, and socioeconomic circumstances. London's diversity is our strength. I'm therefore delighted to shine a spotlight on this diversity of the city and the many extraordinary Londoners this evening. So this evening, you will hear from the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, who is so proud of London's diversity, who is committed to tackling the challenge of structural racism. I'm also delighted to have my colleague and respected Deputy Chairman of the London Assembly, Tony Arbour, who's given years of public service for the well-being of Londoners. Followed by my good friend and colleague, Assemblymember Jeanette Arnold, OBE, who's a committed anti-racism advocate and campaigner. David Lemmy, MP. I met David first when he was aspiring to become an assembly member many years ago. 
Now David is a member of parliament and shadow secretary of state for justice with a bold and no nonsense approach to fighting racism, social justice and inequality. We also have this evening Safia Jama, an inspirational Londoner and CEO of the Women's Inclusive Team, a charity based in Tower Hamlets that has a strong focus on promoting social cohesion within the community. Then we have Sanjay Bandari, who's the chair of Kick It Out, which is football's equality and inclusion organization, will speak us, us about the importance of strength in diversity in sport. This will be followed by City Hall's community engagement team. This team works to give London's diverse communities a platform to be seen, heard, and more actively engaged in the city's decision making. We start our evening's celebration with Shantipat, courtesy of Nisdan Temple in Brent. The prayer recited in Sanskrit is about universal peace, happiness, and well-being of humankind and living beings. It is a perfect introduction to our evening of inclusivity and moving from darkness to light. This event is a thank you for all of you for what you've done and continue to do within your communities. So please sit back and enjoy the show. Thank you. Santu, Sarve Santu Niramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pashantu, Makaschit Dukhamapnuya. Hello everyone, it's Sadiq Khan here, the Mayor of London. I'm delighted to be able to send you this message. I want to begin by paying tribute to the Chair of the London Assembly, Navin Shah. Not only for his outstanding record of public service representing the residents of Brent and Harrow, but for his tireless efforts to promote the values of justice, equality and inclusion right across our city. There's no escaping the fact that the last year has been one of the most testing and traumatic periods in London's history. As we seek to recover and rebuild from this pandemic, we must address the deep-rooted inequalities and injustices that have fueled this crisis and its disproportionate impact. Of course, this won't be easy, but I truly believe it's possible if we tap into that same spirit that has got us through this crisis. Over the last year, we've seen the best of London's communities and spirit. A spirit born of our common humanity and enhanced by our incredible diversity. It's this spirit and sense of social solidarity that we must now draw on to build a better London. A London 
that's fairer, cleaner, greener, and more just and more prosperous. A London where your social class or skin colour is never again the difference between life and death. And a London where every child, regardless of background, has the opportunities and help in hand they need to fulfil their potential. I'm convinced that we can achieve this better and brighter future for all Londoners and that we owe it to our communities who've suffered and given so much for our city during this pandemic to make it a reality. Thank you. I want to start by thanking my colleague, Chair of the Assembly, Assembly Member Shaw, for putting on this celebration of strength in diversity during COVID-19. Such an important event, because through this event, we are recognising and we are saying thank you to the hundreds and thousands of Londoners who during this pandemic showed us just what it is to be a Londoner. We have reached out despite our faith, our ethnicity, our gender, our own personal circumstances. And we have said, we're going to get through this together. I wish you all the very best and I thank you. And I thank everyone who has worked so hard to get us to where we are and who will continue to work to get us post COVID-19. Thank you. Now, I'm going to be taught how to dance the Chichiga dance. And I hope you are learning as I'm learning. All right? So the master of the, the Bachiga in the Chichiga, right? Yes, the Chichiga. going to teach me the right way on how to move. All right, okay, now. ladies and gentlemen, those of you sitting in your rooms, wherever you are, we are going to dance the Chichiga dance. Above this dance, you have to just jump higher, hit the ground harder. That's all about the Chichiga. <laughs> right? Okay, we are going the jump first, so we are going to make one jump as in you have you land harder on the ground. Let's go again. One, two, three, we go. Okay, now after that jump, we are going to add a few steps as in one, two, three, four. So each leg steps twice as in one, it goes back. Eh? Like ten, two, three, four. So we are going to add on the jump. Like we, we jump, right, left, right, left. Okay, are we together? Let's go. Yeah. One, two, three, we go. Jump, right, left, right, left. Jump, right, left, right, left. Jump, right, left, right, left. Okay, let me help you with me. Oh. Now we are going to the body <laughs> movement. Now the bachiga are very strong. So you have to keep your arms wide open. They're just in the front like this. Now, when you're jumping, you have to make sure that the legs come past the arms, as in... Okay, let's go. One, two, three, we go. One, two, three, four, five. We are going to add the morale. You have to morale boost yourself by making some sound, some alarm going, hey, 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 so that you give yourself some energy motivation, right? Okay, let's go. As in, hey, 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 that's all about the machiga. So we're gonna take it from the top. Okay, let's go.
Thank you so much to Navin Shah for inviting me to speak at this celebrating strength gathering today. At the beginning of this crisis, there was so much pain, grief, shock, fear that I saw here in Tottenham and in London. When we looked at the faces of those frontline workers who'd lost their lives back in March, April, it was very much a face of ordinary working people who could have been part of our families. And it was a black and brown face. And there was tremendous concern, frankly, at what was about to take place. I began to get out into the community and I drew real hope. And I drew hope because what I saw was people giving up their time, meeting together, didn't know each other, caused socially distance, wearing a mask, but packing food, gathering items, putting them in cars, driving them to neighbours and offering them support. And that support has continued. That wonderful coming together of mutual aid. I saw it at the London Food Consortium. I saw it at the Tottenham Town Hall where Peace Alliance and Christians had come together. I saw it at the Selby Centre here in the community. And I saw it in countless church halls where food was being packed and people were being supported. Now, let me be clear, I want to live in a society where people aren't going without food, where the six richest economy in the world. We shouldn't need food banks in this way. But without the government being there and with food and hunger and real hardship still a real issue in our society, we all have to step up. And I've been so impressed by the unsung heroes who have done that, who've just been there for people, just got on with it, got out the house and done what they can to support others. And I'm really, really, really grateful for all of that work and all of that effort. And it must continue. Thanks so much. Hello, my name is Sophia Jarma, the founder and CEO of Women's Inclusive Team. WIT is a local charity based in the London borough of Tower Hamlets. We've been running for almost 17 years. During that time, we've supported women and their families. I am so honoured and privileged today to be able to share with you our story during COVID. WIT is an organisation that hears, feels and responds to the needs of local residents. And that is exactly what we did during COVID. With the help of volunteers, we provided a number of services, such as a community kitchen, providing healthy, fresh cooked meals by volunteers and being delivered to the most vulnerable community members. We had a food bank and we made sure that the food bank had food that our members were acquainted with. And we made sure that we called it a food pantry bringing back their dignity and making sure that they had a choice. For those members who were isolated and lonely at home, we made sure that they had daily telephone calls led by volunteers and actually making sure that we prevent ill mental health. As a nation, we have awoken, awoken to the inequalities that certain communities face. Our target group, mainly the Somali community, have disproportionately been affected by COVID. In addition to that, we saw the Black Lives Matters campaign highlighting that they are further disadvantaged. WIT has attended a number of discussions, making sure that stakeholders understand that representation is so important. It's about building trust with the community, making services accessible. WIT has, in addition, lobbied, making sure that stakeholders understand that we need to differentiate between communities, that using the word BAME should not be a tick box exercise. Young people have also been deeply affected during COVID. 
and our Rise and Shine project in partnership with Bernardo's funded by the Department of Education has made a huge difference. Not only supporting our young kids academically, but also making sure that they have workshops tackling and discussing mental health challenges, making sure that they have a voice. That is their life. I am lonely. A year of isolation has broken me. My feelings are shared by like-minded people everywhere, feeling anxious with nothing better to do than bite their nails and pull their hair. Is this my life? I drown in an ocean of self-pity, with nothing but my paranoia for company. I eat and work and sleep, and everyone else eats and works and sleeps in endless harmony, following the rules like obedient sheep. Is this my life? But there are people worse off than you, my mother says. But is there? There are people without families. But is there? Be grateful for what you have. Should I? Look. So I look. Is this their life? I research and read and research and read and I see people overcome with tragedy where a comfortable life is just a fantasy. At least 1,000 die a day while I have the luxury to sleep and eat my miseries away. Is this their life? I learn to be grateful for what I have, to appreciate every single thing. But there are people who dream of my life, whose lives are filled with hardships and strife. That is their life. So who am I to complain? Do I really understand the feeling of pain? While I may be comfortably locked away, at least I have enough to live to see another day. Because this is my life, and that is their life. Just to highlight how demanding this provision was, within 24 hours, we had 351 kids that registered for that project. We had no option but to close registration. Our early years project, Chicksam Preschool, also had challenges where young kids under the age of five that weren't able to attend because of their family needs during the lockdown, we had to create online services creatively supporting them and making sure that they were still learning, still connected, supporting parents where possible. Sadly, young kids have taken 10 steps back and as a nation, we've got to be ready, able and willing to ensure that we support them to catch up, support them to settle back, support them to have a good start in their life. Our health and wellbeing projects looked at mental health for women making sure that they had support to prevent ill mental health. Under the community wellbeing, we also have community safety, making sure that we supported with the prevent agenda, helping parents to keep their children safe during COVID. In addition to that, we tailored our COVID response track and trace, working closely with public health, BART and a CCG to tackle some of the health inequalities and making sure that the community's information that they receive is also equally accessible to them. There is so much work to do because health inequality is definitely something that has been there before and unless we go the extra mile, will continue to be there. What a historic year it has been where Londoners have risen to the challenge, not holding back their time, energy and passion and knowing that time is the most expensive commodity that one can give in charity. The silver lining of communities that have lived in parallel worlds coming together and making a difference. The feedback from volunteers saying how their mental well-being has improved, being a part of a greater cause, giving back and keeping busy. This is history that Londoners have made. As you can see, we've achieved so much in such a short period of time, but we still have a lot to do. The next few months and years ahead is so important. We know the inequalities and the challenges that our members and our communities face was there prior to COVID. But as a nation, we have awoken because we have partnerships with our stakeholders and amazing volunteers, Londoners who have stepped up to the challenge. We need your support. Access is really important. Equality is really important. Together, we can make a difference. As 
सर जो तेरी लागे मैं दीवानी हो गई दीवानी हाँ दीवानी दीवानी हो गई मशहूर मेरे इश्क की कहानी हो गई जो जग ने न मानी तो मैंने भी ठानी कहा थी मैं देखो कहा चली आई कहते हैं ये दीवानी मस्तानी
Hello, I'm Sanjay Bandari. I am the chair of Kick It Out, football's equality and inclusion charity. We have been tackling discrimination and promoting inclusion in football for over 27 years. One of the services that we provide is a reporting service to enable victims or witnesses to report incidents of discrimination from across any level of the game, from the national team to grassroots football. The final months of the 2019-2020 season were severely disrupted by the pandemic, resulting in the suspension of grassroots football and all elite level games being played behind closed doors. Despite that, last season was still the worst we have ever seen in terms of recorded incidents of racism and discrimination. We received a 42% increase in reports of discrimination. Reported incidents of racist abuse doubled over the last two years and reported incidents of homophobic abuse doubled over the last 12 months. But we know that our data is only the tip of the iceberg. We only see what is reported to us. We do not have access to data at clubs, governing bodies, law enforcement or other charities. To get a fuller view of that iceberg, we conducted a YouGov poll of a representative sample of 1,000 football fans nationally. This indicated that 39% of respondents had personally witnessed an incident of discrimination in the previous year, 32% had seen homophobic abuse at a football match, and a staggering 71% had witnessed racist abuse on social media. So what do we do about these and the other challenges that football faces? Last month, Kick It Out launched its new three-year strategy. We serve underrepresented and minority communities in football, supporting them in every area of the game. Our mission is to eliminate discrimination in football and to create a game where everyone feels that they belong. We deliver a number of programmes which fall into three key pillars. The first pillar is advocacy and reporting. Here we campaign for change on key issues and we create transparency reports to hold football to, to account on its promises to change. The biggest issue right now is online hate, which is totally out of control. We have convened a working group with representation from across football, government, law enforcement, Facebook and Twitter. This group has committed to create change and to report progress in public regularly. The second pillar is guidance and education. Here we create understanding through a range of programmes. For example, we train children in Premier League academies on discrimination issues. We also offer rehabilitative education to fans found guilty of discriminatory conduct either at a game or online. The third pillar is talent and here we inspire opportunity. Since October 2020, 48 clubs have committed to gender and ethnicity representation targets in senior leadership and coaching. We will help clubs to achieve those ambitions by bringing football together to change the way that people get in, stay in and get on in the football industry. Football has a unique ability to bring people together and to create community cohesion, whether it is tackling online hate or changing the profile of its workforce to better represent the people who play or watch the game, football has the power to be a beacon of change for society. Our role at Kick It Out is to help to create that change. Hi everyone, it's great to be part of this event today. My name is Melissa and I'm from the GLA Community Engagement Team and we're going to give you an overview of the map of community views, as you, which you can see here. A piece of work we produced to highlight insights shared with us between April and September 2020 on the community impacts of COVID-19. And hi everyone, I'm Olivia from the GLA Community Engagement Team. 
thanks again for having us share this work with you. Um, our team are driven by how lived experiences influence change, the power of human stories. So it's great to be able to take you through the map today. Before getting to the specific insights, we'll start with the why. Why did we embark upon this work? Why did we reach out to these groups? So these news headlines demonstrate that from early on, we knew that the pandemic was having a disproportionate impact. We wanted to find out what people were experiencing on the ground and hear from them firsthand. So we carried out 21 roundtable meetings from April to September 2020. And overall, we engaged with 250 people. These roundtables were hosted by our Deputy Mayor for Social Mobility, Social Integration and Community Engagement, Dr Debbie Weeks Bernard. Due to our team's remit, we focused on the experiences of faith and black and Asian minority ethnic communities. And through the insights gathering, we also picked up on protected characteristics, including age and gender. You can see here from this slide is just a sample of the questions that we used to um, shape the discussions in the roundtables. It really helped us to have a framework like this so that we were then able to analyse those conversations and take it to the next step. So this is where we got to. This is the map in full. We chose this format as it outlines the interconnectedness of many of the issues. So we, we went down from around 22 themes to the 12 themes that you can see in front of you around the perimeter. And we worked closely with Mike Bromberg in the City Intelligence Unit. It really demonstrates the value of good design and shows how it can help us see data in engaging ways. You'll also see these core areas in the centre, four of them. So we're going to zoom in on each of them now, starting with information. We heard that the lack of representation of certain groups on census data meant that they were not receiving targeted supports or that their language needs were not catered for in translated guidance. And these concerns were particular to Somali, East, Southeast Asian and Latin American communities. In terms of language and translations, a Pakistani doctor spoke about how important literacy would be to consider in terms of translations. Much of the older generation cannot read or write well in their own languages, so written materials were still being read out to them. So moving on to inequalities, housing, homeschooling, employment, all issues which interconnect to. And we heard about Filipino health workers having to organise their work rotors based on their house rotors, as many people needed to share the same rooms and beds. Day workers and night workers were sharing beds due to the high cost of renting. And in these settings, of course, impossible to self isolate and to therefore avoid the virus spreading in these particular conditions. The third segment focuses on the civil society and the safety net. And we heard a lot from faith communities who we know have been plugging the gap on food provision. They stepped up most in terms of food delivery to support their congregations and wider communities. They were successful in engaging volunteers, but are concerned for their long term future due to the lack of regular donations coming in from their usual sources, such as church services or usual donations that people give from their income. We heard a lot from people who were in the trap of having no recourse to public funds due to being unable to afford legal status, but therefore being excluded from receiving other financial support from the government. The final segment focuses on health and experiences of the healthcare system and health information. We heard from most roundtables that misinformation has been very damaging throughout, especially when groups have been able to access correct information in their own languages. Lots of community groups mentioned things being circulated on WhatsApp that had had negative impacts on people's ability to protect themselves from the virus. And of course, we know that the same misinformation is affecting the take up of vaccines right now. We also heard from groups who felt that they had been stigmatised due to the pandemic. So Orthodox Jewish communities and Gypsy Roman traveller communities felt that they were being seen as spreaders and targeted with hate crime. And also we saw Islamic communities being stigmatised during the run up to Eid. So what have we done so far? We've of course been sharing the insights back with the community and we made this publicly accessible by the London Data Store and we're taking as many opportunities as we can to connect to wider audiences. 
we've connected concerns to specific GLA's teams. On, for example, on the 19th of November, we hosted a meeting between community and civil society organisations and the GLA's housing and land team so that community groups could share their concerns with policymakers and seek further guidance. Community organisations who highlighted a rise in hate crime and discrimination were connected to MOPAC's hate crime stakeholder leads. We've also been hosting monthly public health briefings since November, led by Professor Kevin Fenton, and over 200 attended the last public health briefing earlier this month. So what can you do? Well, we encourage you to think about how the issues connect to your own work and what actions you could take to support communities on some of the issues that we have raised. Hopefully the snapshot will encourage you to take some time with the map, which is available at the data store at this link, or you can search for map of London community views at data.london.gov.uk. And if anyone is keen to know more, please email us at cejobchair at london.gov.uk. Thank you. And right now, we are going to learn the song. It is a chanting song. Everyone sings. Some people make loud like music. It's called music. I won't call it noise. It is called music. You can just make any sound like Ay -ay 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 -ay. it is just like that, and you have fun. So you are going to sing the song, and you learn the song, and also learn the dance. Enjoy. And the song, very simple. It goes.
from its very beginnings, the GLA has reflected the diversity of London. Over the past 20 years, throughout the powers and the authority which the GLA has had, reflecting both the police authority, the fire authority, transport for London, and all the miscellaneous bodies for which we are responsible, we have endeavoured to reflect the diversity of London. And this really ha has indeed happened from day one, from our very first chairman to the chairman that we currently have, all of whom have personified London themselves. The thing that I'm most proud of as far as the GLA is concerned is that when it comes to the recruitment of staff, we are name blind. We use nothing on the papers that we see when we appoint staff as to their background so that we can employ those people who are absolutely the best for the job. London needs people to work for it who are the very best and that must not be affected in any way by background. It should simply be done on the basis of ability and potential. I'm proud that we have succeeded in this. It's right after 20 years that we here at City Hall should be celebrating this. Navin is the very person to do this. I note, of course, uh, that Navin describes himself as chair. I still call myself chairman, which shows that I'm really prehistoric. But nevertheless, even prehistoric people know that London needs to be served by people who reflect London. We are doing this, and I'm confident that we should do that for the next 20 years. I wish every good fortune to the GLA. Thank you. This has been a hugely inspiring evening. I would like to thank our speakers for their powerful contributions and our talented performers who have kept us entertained. Thank you to the Bollywood Co who captured the magic and energy of Bollywood dances and wowed us with their fantastic performances. And Bantu Arts who gave a wonderful showcase of traditional African and Ugandan performing arts. Now, before we go our separate ways, I ask you to take a moment to think about what strength in diversity means to you. When I think of strength in diversity, I see people coming together, united as one in a passionate community that I am proud to call London. It inspires me to focus on our diverse capital and the many wonderful Londoners we have heard from this evening. But we must not forget about the structural changes needed to combat racism and bring about genuine equality. I will continue to stand up for that in all that I do and ask you to do so too. Thank you and good night. <laughs>